Hello, and welcome to Women in Business, where we interview entrepreneurs and senior managers and show you the strengths, successes, obstacles, and roadblocks women experience in business. Since I believe every person in business needs to be visible, I'd like to invite you to watch www.sob6, that's the number six, tips.com, which will give you some valuable information should you get the call to be on radio or TV, which I think is extremely important. If you'd like to contact me personally, drop me a line at Gail Carson, that's G-A-Y-L-E, Gail Carson 13 at gmail.com, or go to my website, www.spunkyoldbroad.com and sign up for my weekly newsletter. My guest today is Dr. Francois Booker Drew. She's a network weaver who believes relationships are the key to our personal, professional, and organizational growth. She's been quoted in Forbes, Ozzy, Bustle, Huffington Post, and other media outlets due to an extensive background in leadership, nonprofit management, partnership development, training, and education. She's currently Vice President of Community Affairs for the State Fair of Texas, responsible for grant-making, educational program, and community initiatives, and is also co-founder for Heritage, which is H-E-R, Heritage, Giving Circle, and the owner of Solstice Consultancy. She graduated with a PhD from Antioch University in Leadership and Change with a focus on social capital. And uh, she is also uh, a very, very big in education because she's an adjunct professor at Tulane University and the author of three workbooks for women, Fly Away, Ready for a Revolution, and 30 Days to Jolt Your Life, and Rules of Engagement, Making Connections Last. Welcome, Dr. Francois, and I'm going to just call you Francois from now on. How are you? (laughs) I am doing well. I'm so thankful to be here with you today. Well, thank you. We're wonderfully happy to have you. And, you know, I work as a facilitator. I I run a not-for-profit group. Uh, I have a mastermind group, and I have 10 uh, organizations in there, Habitat for Humanity, Girl Scouts, Special Olympics, and so forth. So I know and admire all the things that you have done, and the nonprofit world is a totally different world from everything else that we know. We think about them in one way, but they're they're very valuable and they're going through a very tough time now. So you talk about social capital. What is it and why is it important? You know, I remember when I first heard the word, I had never heard of the term. And when I was working on my PhD, my advisor said, I think you need to look this up because this is what you do all the time. And social capital really is about building relationships, networks, associations. So we all do it and we all have it. I I don't think we recognize how important it is. And just as we think about financial capital and the resources that we have with money, or we think about our education as a form of a resource or capital, I don't think we think about our relationships in the same way where we see our relationships as opportunities, not just for transaction, they can do that. But I think we need to look at our relationships as opportunity for transformation because our relationships can really help us both personally and professional professionally. And I think it's so important for us to begin to pay attention to how we're growing our networks, not just for us, but how do we leverage them? Like you talked about your work in the nonprofit sector. How do you use those relationships to help the greater good? And that's important. Well, you know, it is it is interesting. Uh, I think these women, I have 10 of them, uh, these women are absolutely the most sharing uh, of, of anybody. I mean, when somebody says, uh, for example, our last meeting, we meet once a month for, for three and a half hours, and um, we're meeting, meeting virtually now, but, um, you know, one says, gee, I have this position open, and somebody else says, well, I interviewed this person, I loved her, but I didn't have a place for her, so call her. They're referring people. They help with grants. They do uh, contacts. Uh, a lot of what they went through now to get subsidized with various uh, federal programs, they've helped one another, which banks to go to. I mean, it's just exceptional. So that is, you say, very important for women to be intentional about building their networks. And they have a great network uh, with each other and, of course, people outside their network. So how do women 
be intentional about this? I mean, do they say, hmm, okay, here's a list of 10 and here are the most important people I need to speak to, or how do they come up with this list? That That's such an awesome question. I mean, just listening to you talk about the nonprofits, that's an example of social capital. So how do we as women think about our existing networks and the people that we're around? How do we begin to start having these conversations with them about how they can help us? I think sometimes as women, it's so easy for us to want to help each other, but we don't think about ways in which we can use our friends and our families as resources to go to the next level, whether it's in our education or in our business or our jobs. How do we begin to just get that list of 10? And right now you've got a captive audience because of um, being quarantined for many of us. So how do you begin to reach out using your LinkedIn network? And it doesn't have to be, you know, reaching out to Oprah. I would love that if somebody could connect me to her, but it doesn't necessarily mean that's who you reach out to. It really could be something as simple as who are 10 folks that are in your network on LinkedIn that you send a note to and you have a virtual coffee session. And it's just to ask questions and to learn from them with no expectation. But I have found that when we're vulnerable and when we're open to possibilities, wonderful things can happen, just like you shared about job opportunities and people sharing resources with one another. It's creating the space to do that and getting that list of 10, whether it's on LinkedIn, your Facebook page, reaching out to people that you haven't caught up with is a great start. So you talk about reaching out and you talk about getting together and you talk about um, social, uh, narratives. And so what is the power of the narratives? You know, how is it tied to our identities and why should women embrace their stories even when they may be painful? And that's the one thing I love about this group, uh, is, uh, they do share the good and the bad. Of course, everything is confidential and nothing goes outside of the mastermind. And I send them notes for every meeting, uh, so they have a remembrance of what was said. But, um, you know, they have to feel they're in a safe space as well. Definitely. And, you know, when, when I was doing my research group, one of the things that I found that was so amazing was creating those spaces for women to share their stories. And regardless of ethnicity, you know, of their backgrounds, education, when women had these spaces where they could be vulnerable and share, they were able to really connect to each other. We take for granted the power of emotion and emotion connects us to one another. And that's a part of our stories. And whether I've had your experience or not, I can still be able to go, wow, I understood that because of the pain that it may have caused you. And embracing our stories and our narrative, it allows us to embrace the totality of who we are. And it also serves as a gift to others. When we're able to be free about our own experiences, it really allows other people the opportunity to do the same thing and to be able to connect with you at a deeper level. So I remember in my group, I had two women, very different backgrounds, and they both were unemployed. And it was very interesting listening to them talk about their perspectives on unemployment. For one lady, her identity was tied to not having a job. The other lady was trying to figure out how to survive and be able to take care of her family. But in that moment, even though they had very different experiences, they were able to connect around, I know what it's like not to have a job, and they were able to help each other. And in doing that, they both ended up finding, you know, employment opportunities. We had another lady in our group who talked about, you know, some very painful situations with her mother that were traumatic. None of us had ever gone through that kind of trauma with a parent, but what we could connect to was the emotion and the vulnerability that she had at that moment. She was so authentic. And I think in our world right now, people are craving for authentic leadership and people who are willing to be honest about who they are. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to tell every intimate detail about your life, 
but it does mean that we're comfortable in who we are and how those experiences have shaped us. And it gives you sensitivity to others because as you embrace your own story and your own pain, you're able to listen to others and go, that makes sense. I understand why this person behaves the way that they do. And it gives us a chance to, to be human together. And I think right now we need more of that. Well, I totally agree with you. And I do think your story is really important. However, we never want the story to totally define us. Uh, there are still people who are living in their story when they have to move on. And that's very, very important. And I know that you're a big advocate for mentoring. And I think that mentoring uh, and, you know, this is really important for someone who needs to move on. So what do you think about mentoring and why it's such a necessary component in leadership, especially for women? You know, I would not be in the position that I've been in without mentoring being such a thread in my story. There have been so many amazing people, both male and female, who have come alongside me and really spoken into my life and, and challenged me, both on a personal and professional level. I don't think I would have gone back to school um, you know, at, in my 40s to get a PhD. And there were people who were much older in the same situation who had people speak into their lives and said to them, you can do this. And I had folks who challenged me. Mentoring is so important because one thing, it allows you to not only give information, but you're learning from those people that are being mentored by you. So I have people that are younger than me that speak into my life. There is so much that I don't understand about some of the things that are popular and what goes on today. And I'm learning and I'm able to not only share my experience, but I'm gaining so much from those relationships. So mentoring is really a two way street. And I think it's important for women to be able to distinguish between mentoring and sponsorship. Because quite often in job opportunities, we need people to not just give us advice, which is mentoring and walking with us. We need people like your group you talked about, Gail. We need folks who open doors and say, I'm going to make a phone call and I'm going to put your resume in front of someone. That's sponsorship. And for women, I think it's important to do both is to open up doors, allow ourselves to, to have people open up those doors, but to mentor and be mentored. And then mentoring is about legacy. How do you continue to um, duplicate what you've done and plant those seeds in others so that the values that are important to you continue to blossom and grow well beyond you and your lifetime? I'm so glad you made that um, definition uh, and, this, and the specific, specific, specificity of sponsorship and mentorship because, they, yes, they are different. Sponsorships are when people open a door or say, this is a person you should contact, or I will write a letter of recommendation for you, or uh, I will introduce you to. And mentoring is someone you can call on uh, and, and you say, well, I have these choices, what should I do? Or how do I handle this? Or, or where should I go? Uh, these kinds of things. So uh, very, very important. But you also, you've written all these books and um, the premise of your first book was Rules of Engagement, Making Connections Last. So why did you write that book? You know, it was a part of my research group where I was listening to all these amazing women tell their stories. And it made me want to write a book that helps women really think about the power of their narrative and how their narrative either harms or helps them in connecting to each other. And it begins with knowing your own story. I would hear women say all the time, a number of women rather, would say things like, you know, I can't find good friends or I can't find a mate who who's suitable. And after a point, I started questioning, well, you know, is, is it necessarily that all these people that are around you are problematic? And maybe they are, but it means that you got to examine that you're the common denominator. So how do you begin to start thinking about the story that you're telling? Because our words give life. And, and if we're constantly saying negative things, then we're going to begin to bring quite often those things in our lives. And I'm not talking about very tragic situations that occur where people are violated. That's something totally different. But being aware of those things that we do have control over and making sure that 
we're using our words in a way to frame what it is that we want out of our lives. And so the book was really to help women think about their stories and give them some lessons based on what I heard those women talk about and how they were connecting, but also my own personal stories. And it's a workbook. I'm really big on reflective learning because I think, you know, you can read a book and we see this with conferences. People will go to conferences and come back with all this knowledge and continue to do the same thing that they were doing before the conference. So my Mine is how do I write books that not only inspire people, but inspire them to action. And the workbook is really designed to have women think about, you know, what's been written, my own personal stories, and then how they can apply that to their lives and make the changes that they want to see to get the relationships that they desire, both personally and professionally. Well, uh, I agree with you. And it was, I was laughing when you said you went back to school. I got my doctorate in my 40s as well. So <laughs> I'm right there with you. But Yay! <laughs> uh, your latest book is called Fly Away. Yes. So what about that book? And share at least one lesson with us. So that book was written for my daughter when she was getting ready to go to college a couple of years ago. You know, as a parent, you're terrified when they're getting ready to leave, did I teach you everything? And so I was so concerned. I was telling her all these things before she left. And she's like, mom, I'm good. I think I've got this. And I was still really worried. And I said, well, I want to write something down for her. That's legacy. Because I, I tend to think about that um, as I get older, just the importance of building legacy. And I wanted something that she would have, but my great, great, great grandchildren would be able to pick up and know a piece of who I am and what was important to me. And so I wrote this book of lessons for my daughter about things that no one really told me about in transitioning to become a woman. Uh, you know, your parents tell you a lot of things, but there are certain experiences that you just have that no one can prepare you for. And so I wanted her to, to know what it was like moving into this next phase of her life. And one of the lessons that I told her in the book is I want you to speak up for yourself um, because a man in a suit and tie just did. And I wanted her to know that so often as women, we walk into situations and discount our abilities before we even get started. And I told her at any table that you want to be at, you have the right and voice to be at that table. And if you're not able to be at that table, then create it. Don't feel like you don't have the ability to change that narrative. You do. And I gave her the example about, I had a boss who told me that male boss who said when he applies for a job, if he has 30% of the qualifications, he applies. And that stunned me because I wouldn't apply unless I had 90% of the qualifications. And he felt like I could, you know, he could get on a job and learn whatever else he needed to and surround himself with everyone. And that taught me a valuable lesson is that I was already discounting my ability and not even throwing my hat in the ring because I didn't feel like I had everything. And he saw it from a standpoint of, I had a few things, I can build the rest of them. And I wanted my daughter to know that story so that she and other young women could begin to start looking at what they do have, those assets, but also not discounting their voice and their abilities before they even get in the door. And so that's that, what the book that is really about. a male trait, uh, uh Francois, that is a definite male trait. I teach that same thing. I say men will apply when they have one or two of the 10 requirements. Yes. Whereas a woman won't even apply if she has nine. Yes. And so it's, you are right on target there. And that is very frustrating. And it's a tough, it's a tough belief to get over. It is. It, amazing, it, amazing. It, and it's a mindset and it's helping women to change the mindset, even how women sit at tables in meetings where you'll see women, I have to catch myself because it's so easy to just go to the back and hide. And there's a young lady I'm working with now. She does this amazing work in helping businesses with strategy. And she creates a flyer and nowhere on the flyer does she have her picture or her credentials. She does not talk about how she's transformed multi-million dollar businesses to success. And so I sent her a note back and I said, why are you hiding? And she was like, oh my goodness, you saw it. I said, yes, because I used to do the same thing. You can't hide. You've got something to offer. And I wanted my daughter and so many other women who read it to begin to start seeing themselves as valuable and that they deserve to be wherever it is they want to be. And what they don't know, they can learn and surround themselves with people who can teach them and get them there. 
Wow. So she really, uh, she recognized she was hiding. There are so many women who don't recognize that they're hiding. But you also just completed a, a TEDx talk, and that was on proximity and presence. So where does that fit into things? I mean, what can we do to be in community with others, and especially now when we're social distancing? Hopefully, people are still socially distancing. It doesn't look like they are after this weekend. <laughs> I know. I agree with you totally. I That's why I'm not moving out of my abode until everybody pays attention. <laughs> yes, I, I am. I am so with you. I'm so concerned, you know, and I really hate that they coined it social distancing because it's physical distancing. We are wired to be in community and in relationship with each other and not having that has such an impact on who we are. I love referencing the Blue Zones research that talked about how these people live to be over 100 years old. And what they found was, in addition to them having a glass of wine at night, which was amazing, I'm like, okay, um, <laughs> and their diet, what they found was that they, these people had social communities, whether it was their, uh, their faith community or they were playing bingo with people, that they had these social communities. So for our own longevity, we have to um, connect to people. And so the whole TED Talk is really about helping people recognize that we are becoming increasingly more polarized um, because of our, our belief systems and we don't deal with people who disagree with us. And that has so many consequences to our lives. And I wanted people to think about, and this was before COVID, so it's even more impactful now, that we have to be really intentional about creating these spaces for us to be close to each other and to be in community. Whether we agree or not, we need these moments of cognitive dissonance that make us go, oh my goodness, I may not agree with it, but let me check my own belief system. And maybe you're right. And maybe we're both right. That was the point of the talk. Interesting. Well, we're coming to the end of the show, Francois. So I want to make sure that, that everybody knows how to reach you. So what is the best way to get in touch with you? And I don't know if you have a gift you'd like to offer to anybody, but um, you know, how can they reach you? What's the most convenient way? So they can reach me at info at drfrancois.com. And the first three people that send me an email at info at drfroswa.com, I will mail you a book on me. So those first three people, I'd love to share my work with you and, and get you more familiar with who I am. And then you can go to my website at drfroswa.com to learn more and, you know, reach out to me. I'm always glad to connect. Okay, now make sure, folks, that you're getting her name right, Dr. Frosois. It is F. R O S W A. And I don't think this is a whole lot of them around. So if you Google her, you're going to find her. And that's a very key thing because you can tell she has a lot of information for you. But for those of you, you know, it is such an ideal time for women to be in business. It's such an ideal time for you to make the switch to whatever it is you want to do because jobs are not going back to where they were. Yes. It is an ideal time for you to say, what do I really want for my life? And to really plan it out. Now, yeah, it's not always going to go that way. There's a lot of twists and turns. She and I will be able to tell you that for sure. Yes. But it's also important for you to, uh, to to get on the right path. So we have about uh, a minute or two left, Dr. Francois. Uh, what would you like to leave our audience with? I want them to do exactly what you said. This is an opportunity for purpose. Connect to your pur purpose and think about what your passion is. And when those two intersect, watch what happens. Yeah, that is so important, folks. Uh, you have no idea um, how it is so important to to look for opportunity. Uh, sometimes I think people are on, um, gosh, I don't know what, but I would say just not aware of what's going on. I mean, you've got to be tuned in. And that's what I think people are lacking. You've got to be tuned in to your surroundings, to the people around you, to the contacts you have, to the people who are in your life. You never know where that's going to lead you. And so, uh, you know, here's somebody who has kind of been through it all. She's written about it. She's got workbooks on it. Um, and she's a firm believer 
that women can do whatever women want to do. Yes. And, uh, you know, it's funny because people always say, well, you know, back in the time when women were supposed to be housewives, and I had to laugh because I was in business in 1959, 60. So I did it before it was popular, but I didn't know it wasn't popular. It was just something I, I knew I had to do. So um, follow her lead, listen to this show over and over, listen to what she's had to say. I really think that you'll get some really pearls of wisdom out of this if you really pay attention to some of the things that she's talking to you about. So thank you so much for being with us, doctor. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank you, doctor. <laughs> we appreciate you. And uh, hopefully a lot of people will take advantage and will be the first three to get your books because I know they're going to be very valuable. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you. Hi, this is Dr. Gale. And I wanted you to know I have a whole bunch of other things to offer you. If you go to spunkyoldbroad.com, you will see an array of SOB stuff for sale and all our latest products and additions. If you're interested in getting on TV, I have a brand new course, Get on TV. And if you want to start your own business, you'll want my SOB Guide to Business Success. I know you'll love them all. I guarantee it. Thanks for listening to Women in Business. I hope you enjoyed today's show. And if you have any suggestions as to who you'd like me to have as a guest, just email me at gailcarson13 at gmail.com. Be sure to check out www.sob6tips.com. And in the meantime, go to www.spunkyoldbroad.com to see the resources I have for you.